Efforts are continuing to free those trapped by today's magnitude 6.3 earthquake in Canterbury that brought death and widespread destruction to Christchurch. The quake hit 10 kilometers southeast of the city just before one o'clock. Roads, buildings, homes and core infrastructure have all been damaged extensively and fires are burning. The police say people died when buses were crushed by falling buildings. When the earthquake happened and Scott had fallen, Mark White was asked to lift him and I was asked to go along and act as conservation support. We were very worried people had been digging around his face to try and see whether the face was still there because he'd landed in the mud. In doing so they were actually causing damage because obviously they were trying to scrape away at the marble on his face. We had a very short time frame, getting the crane was an absolute nightmare. We were literally given 10 minutes kind of notice. Mark had already made the beautiful plinth that it sat on, so it was all ready to go. Robert Falcon Scott was a rock star of his day. He was probably one of the most famous people on the planet. Back then, the world was still waiting for those far parts to be explored, and, and Robert Falcon Scott was at the very forefront of that. His famous race to the South Pole, when he and his polar party perished on the way back after being beaten by Amundsen, was something which went down in history and became legend, and it was something which really echoed down generations of school children. Christchurch had a particularly strong relationship with the heroic era of Antarctic exploration. In 1901, when Robert Falcon Scott did his discovery expedition, his cousin, Julian Scott, who worked at the University of Canterbury, he wrote to Scott suggesting Christchurch as a base. He had a family connection, and of course he was so well received when they came south. The team of the Discovery uh, used Christchurch and the Canterbury Museum as a place to undertake their research and work with their specimens. Christchurch really took these explorers to heart. They welcomed them into their homes, they held special dances and dinners in their honour. Crowds gathered at Littleton Port to farewell the ship as it went down to the ice. Christchurch was the Cape Canaveral of its day. This was where the expeditions came and Littleton was the port from which thousands of people would see off these expeditions as these famed explorers went off to try and conquer the last great continent. Kathleen was a, an English-born sculptor. She was a really prominent artist in her own right. She had studied at the Slade School of Art in London and also in Paris and she and Robert Falcon Scott married in 1908 and actually had very limited time together. In 1910 she really spent her last happy days with her husband right here in, in Christchurch. After the Terranova departed she returned back to the UK. In 1913 she began the journey back to New Zealand. While she was in the Pacific she learnt that Scott and the Polar Party had actually perished a year earlier in March 1912. When that news was announced, literally the city went into mourning. Within days, there was this call for a, a local memorial. In 1915, the, the Scott Memorial Fund actually commissioned Kathleen to make the Scott Memorial, and it's quite an extraordinary feat. It was carved from 12 cubic metres of marble in Italy during the First World War and then they shipped all the way here to Christchurch where it was unveiled and it's a really extraordinary work. As children we all studied the heroic age of exploration and we had the Scott statue here so we all learnt about the history and what that meant to our city. When he came down, our first point of call was to get him in somewhere safe, which we did pretty quickly. The next stage from that is then deciding what earth we were going to do. It's a compound fracture. It was basically two slopes through both legs, 
uh, and one of the slopes is actually quite heavily inclined. It's uh, more vertical than 45 degrees, as well as that there's some fractures that go beyond the actual broken zone itself. Because the break was so complex and it's at such a difficult angle, and initially all the engineers were like, no way, no way. We've gone through uh, probably about eight different options before we sort of settled on this option and the option that we're currently working through on. Our repair uh, process involves drilling and installing four carbon fibre rods about 1.8 metres long, right up both legs, and then at the location of the fracture we're actually putting in some carbon fibre in a square configuration within the circular ankles, carbon fibre toe, which basically holds everything together to allow these, the repair to actually survive the future earthquake effects. And then beyond that, the statue, if we have an earthquake, is even greater than what we are allowing for. We have the whole base is actually spring-loaded and just operate very much like a suspension on a truck, which would cause the, the whole of the sculpture to just rock very gently side by side if we got a very, very large earthquake. So as part of the process, so because it's such an important statue, we're actually making up a facsimile of one leg. Um, as a test piece and it's being carved to mimic the right leg of the Scott statue. I took a mould of the real leg, I just used a clay mould and then poured plaster of Paris into that to get the cast out that I then could measure from to carve the marble leg and then know that I was carving something that looked similar to the original. And then I broke the leg, or cut it, with the same sort of angle as this compound fracture through his right leg. Then we glued that together. Then we drilled the holes for the carbon fibre rods, and then the holes for the carbon fibre toe. And we did the whole procedure and then tested it at Holmes Consulting to see whether it was going to withstand future earthquakes. We're intending to do a load at 125% of the test load, another one at 150, and then beyond that, we're just going to push it until it just see how far it goes. My joints are on and uh, load's coming on. So we're slowly increasing the load up to 125% of the design load, and that's roughly 1.9 tonnes. Hey Grant, do you want to come have a look? Now we are going to failure, so we're going to push it and see what it can take. One ton, 1.4 tons, 1.5, 2.7, 2.8, oh, come down, 2.8, 2.9, oh, there's 3.4 tons, 3.5, 3 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, 3.9, 9. Yeah, that's it. 3.9 tons, ladies and gentlemen. Still attached on here, see? Pretty good product. Pretty good workmanship, mate. Well, yeah. <laughs> Pretty much as we expected. It met our test load very, very well with only a airline cracking, and we pushed it through, and it is now taking twice our test load or the design load. It's obviously pretty trashed now, but it's gone well beyond what we expected. This is proof of concept. Uh, this is we're absolutely satisfied that this is uh, what's required for the repair of the statue. He has to be held in an upside down fashion in order for me to drill the holes. I thought maybe sand will hold him steady, you know, because he has to be steady when I'm drilling the holes, you know. I think in terms of a steel frame, kind of two stories high, 2.7 by 2.7, and then big polystyrene block, Scott's upside down, gently lowered down, and so we have, have his head and shoulders resting on the polystyrene block. We just put in a dry sand up to his navel level, held as best we can. Uh, rigidly within this box and effectively it allows Mark to actually lower the pump down under controlled situations. Then we, yeah, we lowered his feet. Yeah, up a tiny bit. Okay. <coughs> I carved out an inner cavity on both legs for the glue that we used in there to sit in because it has to be a certain volume. And then we put the epoxy in 
and then lowered this down. Good that way, but see, we've got all the yeah. stuff coming out. Yeah. What? It's moving. Yeah, cool. Cool, Rob. Keep, keep, that. keep it going. That's an oval hole, yes. but I can see that internal yeah. corner on. Yes, yeah. And so all I've got to do is then aim for that, keep, keep away from here. Yeah, and just uh, and just go we had to know where that drill hole was going. I didn't want to pop through the knee when I was drilling. So the only way to do that is to make a mock-up of the inside volume by taking contours marking out where they are and then replicating that in the frame and clicking all the contours together. We inserted groups of carbon fibre rod through the, the cavity and we floated that to where it was all happening. I knew exactly that if we put the drill, it was a very long drill bit, it's a two metre drill bit, that that would, would mean that when I was drilling it would go down exactly the right place. It's just a slow grinding, if you like. We fill the hole up with a measured amount of epoxy. Then we drop the carbon fibre rod in and the epoxy comes up to the top with the displacement. We use those templates to indicate where the carbon fibre toe would go. Where we put the carbon fibre toe around, the holes have to be very accurate. The inside corners have to be rounded out with the wee air grinder because carbon fibre toe doesn't like sharp corners. This goes around 24 times. 12,000 strands of carbon fibre. So that is incredibly strong. The hairiest moment for me was injecting the encapsulating resin to encapsulate the carbon fibre toe and to make sure that there's no air pockets. I just kept firing epoxy in and it was just pouring out and all over the floor in here. It didn't matter, that's why all this plastic's over them. That's pretty hairy because those carbon fibre toes do have to be totally encapsulated with no air pocket. Some of these marble cores that I retrieved from drilling out for the carbon fibre toe, we crushed them up to make a powder and some fines and a wee bit of marble chip in there. And I mix that with the epoxy that doesn't yellow in ultraviolet light, mix it up into a paste and just applied that into the hole. Our, our real concern was not really getting them out of the sand pit, that was okay. So we just want to be really careful not to... Sand was suctioned back off and then he was basically excavated down and by hand going right up to the object. And then slowly, slowly, slowly lifted him out. Uh, what's the work there now, Mark? Three tons. Three tons, yeah. The real concern that everyone had was when, uh, to get him upright again, he has to go horizontal. At that point, you've basically got two drops which are at either end and you've got everything you know is pivoting on his weakest point which is where the repair is. I mean Kathleen Scott had said absolutely that he must travel vertically and upright. But actually I think he came up really nicely and as soon as he was upright that's fine. She knew that um, his legs were really really fragile. Then we had to take off all the wrapping, um, which was kind of a big reveal. That's really the moment of truth. It was just great to see that underneath there really wasn't any major damage at all. Once he was upright, there was a discussion that he might go in a cage. If you can actually watch him and have that visual, it really makes it much easier. The 
power company and everyone else confirmed that he could actually travel on a very low loading truck. There wasn't any major bumps in the road. Symbolically, not only does it help for us as a city to uh, restore some of our iconic heritage, but I also think that it's a symbol of the foundation of Christchurch and New Zealand's presence in the Antarctic. And the forerunner, what happens there today is as a number of nations work in harmony to try and better understand this planet as we live and cope with the changing climate and world. Actually repairing it required a very special technology which we haven't tried here before. They've done a fantastic job and so this should withstand not only the time that uh, we will expect it to be standing um, for future generations but it will withstand future seismic events as well. On the 9th of February 1917, 100 years ago, a huge crowd of people gathered here for the original unveiling ceremony of the statue that commemorates that heroic age of exploration as represented by Robert Falcon Scott and those who perished on that expedition. This is an incredibly special occasion. You'll see from the smile on my face that I've been looking forward to this for a very, very long time. They're stoked. They were, they were literally, you know, air punching. I think they were like, you know, we knew we could do it. It really was quite a jubilant time. Well, it means a lot because obviously it's that connection to the past, but I see Antarctica as very much about our future.